But wait, wait, wait. Herman said there'd be enough transports to supply you guys, even, even surround it and everything. What? Herman's an idiot. Well, y yeah, but you might want to keep that under your hat, Jose. You know, loose lips and all. Okay. Good luck. December 11th, 1942. One year ago this week, the Japanese declared war on Britain, the Netherlands, the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and South Africa, attacking Malaya, the Philippines, Wake Island, Guam, Hong Kong, the Dutch East Indies, and Hawaii. Within days, a whole lot of other countries were at war with Japan as well. And Japan has not gotten much help from her own allies this past year, as she has constantly fought for empire. And in spite of a great many victories, even as recently as last week, for some Japanese troops, the present is grim indeed as they face starvation. I'm Mindy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Japanese defeated the Americans at sea, but Allied attacks on Papua New Guinea might be getting somewhere. However, advances in Tunisia, the Rajev Salient, Veliki Luki, and the Stalingrad area all slowed down in places that, especially North Africa and Stalingrad, great gains had just recently been made. Well, in Libya, at least, the Allies are advancing again. The 8th Army begins moving on the 11th, heading west. In Tunisia, however, on the 6th, the Allies are pushed back towards Medjez El Bab by German attacks that continue for several days. On the 8th, the Germans occupy Bizerta, taking four French destroyers and nine submarines. By then, the Allies hold a defensive line just east of Medjez El Bab, but Walter Nehring's forces attack again the 9th, though he cannot break the Allied defenses. So it is here then that the Allies will build up for another offensive of their own to be launched within a week or two. They really need to take Tunis before the rains come to maintain momentum. But, but how has it come to this? I mean, they took 200 kilometers of coastline to the west and shattered the Axis lines to the east just a month ago. Robert Satino talks about the reasons for this failure to win the race to Tunis in the Wehrmacht retreats. For starters, the Axis have the major aerial advantage. They have 850 planes flying from all weather fields near Tunis and Bizerta. The Allies have a dirt strip at Bonnet. It shuts down when it rains and can only handle a few planes at a time. This means that the Allied troops, who are pretty beat as well after racing all that way east across North Africa, are now under constant bombardment. In a more general sense, however, early December was the moment that Clausewitz had called the Kulminationspunkt, the culmination point of a campaign, when the attacker's initial strength has carried him as far as he can go, and he is now ripe for the counterstroke. We'll see soon enough if and when any big counterstrokes come. There is a small one, though. On the 11th, three Italian manned torpedoes sink four Allied ships in Algiers Harbor. On the 7th, actually, three try in Gibraltar, but that mission is a total failure. The Japanese are getting really tired of failure. Failure to supply their men on Guadalcanal, who have reached the point of starvation. They try to supply them again this week using the floating drum method, sending 12 ships, three of them as screens, on the 7th. Allied dive bombers fail, and then a flotilla of PT boats succeeds in driving them off without a loss. This is a major coup for the PT crews, considering that only last week, 11 major warships failed to do the same job and took heavy casualties. The next day, at a Rabaul conference, the Japanese Imperial Navy delegation says they're going to stop all destroyer transport and supply runs effective immediately. When Hitochi Imamura, now in overall charge of the Solomon's campaign, protests, they say they'll allow one more run to Guadalcanal and one to Buna. Submarines are still bringing in supplies, of course, some 20 tons over three nights in early December. But American intelligence finally cracks the scheduling, and the night of the 8th, two PT boats destroy submarine I-3 as she is unloading. Submarine supply runs are then also suspended. Without supplying runs, though, it means that the Japanese on Guadalcanal will be sacrificed since they will starve to death. 
So the Navy gets together 11 destroyers for a run on the 11th. Five of them just as escorts. A personal message from Yamamoto underscored the importance of this mission, but other signals enabled American radio intelligence to issue a precise report of the composition, timing, and destination of the reinforcement unit. But the 14 dive bombers sent out based on this information do no damage to the convoy. The six destroyers actually carrying the cargo cast off 1,200 supply drums off Cape Esperance and begin withdrawing at 1.15 a.m. But they get hit by five PT boats, damaging Raisa Tanaka's flagship so severely that it is scuttled later in the night. Tanaka himself is wounded. Just 200 drums reach their intended destination. An Allied supply convoy of Bren gun carriers and howitzers finally arrives at Buna on Papua New Guinea, and the Americans attack again there the 5th with air support. But it turns out that all the sand protecting the Japanese bunkers can absorb a heck of a lot of impact, and it is going to take serious hand-to-hand -hand fighting to get the enemy out. On the 6th, the Americans reach the beach east of Buna. The next day, there are strong Japanese attacks. The Australians attack Gona with little success the 6th, but the 8th and 9th, they storm Japanese positions there, finally blasting apart the dugouts at Gona Mission. The situation there, it's interesting, you know? As Martin Gilbert notes, the Japanese cannot yet be dislodged from the Buna mission or the Soputa Sanananda track. Thus, 15,000 Australians and 15,000 Americans, despite complete mastery of the air and virtual mastery of the sea, found themselves in vicious combat with less than half their number of Japanese. But Gona has fallen. Buna has not, of course, and there are still loads of Japanese at Gona needing to be flushed out. But it's a big deal. And on Guadalcanal the 9th comes the changing of the guard. Alexander van der Grift's first marines are finally to be relieved after so many solid weeks of fighting. The last of the Americal Division's men arrive the 8th, and Alexander Patch and the army take over command from the marines. It isn't just the Japanese who are having supply issues, of course. German Air Force Enigma intercepts by the British make it clear that because of all the German transports sent to supply the fight in Tunisia, there are no longer enough to fully, or even close to fully, supply the Stalingrad defenders. London is keeping Joseph Stalin abreast of these developments. But there are constant developments on the ground in and near the whole Stalingrad region. Nikolai Vatutin's Soviet Southwestern Front has been gearing up for more big attacks on the River Cher to begin now on the 7th. This doesn't mean they've just been sitting around. Prokofi Romanenko's 5th Tank Army still pounds Ryshovsky the first couple days of the week. But still, the 1st Tank Corps is what the shock group is organized around. And the plan is to break through the enemy just southwest of Ostrovsky, then head south and then southeast towards Nizhne Cherskaya. Hitting the enemy there would sabotage his defenses along the whole lower chair and cut communications with the Stalingrad pocket. The attack is to hit at the junction of the German 336 Infantry and Group Stelle, where they expect the defenses to be at their weakest. On the shock group's left flank will come attacks towards Novo Maximovsky and villages on the southern bank of the chair, and on the right towards Sorovikino. Then on the 9th, the offensive will be expanded when the 5th Mechanized Corps attacks west of Sorovikino south towards Tormosin. These attacks will, ideally, spoil any planned relief operations aimed at Stalingrad from the west. When things kick off the 7th, there are gains, but there are heavy, heavy casualties. Romanenko insists, however, that the 1st Tank Corps achieve its goals no matter the cost. In other words, destroying the enemy's Nizhne Chirskaya grouping by the end of the 8th. However, the Germans counterattack early that morning, and within a few hours, wreck about a third of that tank force. 53 tanks, losing just 10 of their own. The intelligence report submitted by 5th Tank Army to the General Staff on December 8th dispelled any lingering doubts within the Stavka regarding the Germans' intent to assemble a large force in the Tormosin region south of the Chir River to rescue 6th Army. Stavka then orders a 5th Shock Army to be created to reinforce 5th Tank Army and to beat the 48th Panzer Corps and prevent such a relief operation. 
Andrei Yeremenko's Stalingrad Front is to form this shock army in four days, by the 12th, so tomorrow. This army is under Markian Popov and is to take over operations opposite Rychovsky on 5th Tank Army's left. After finally destroying the Nizhny Cherskaya and Tormosin groupings, it will continue its offensive north of the Don. The formation of 5th Shock Army was significant for two reasons. First, it indicated the Stavka's understanding that new and more powerful forces were required to seize the Rychovsky and Nizhny Cherskaya regions and end any hope of relieving the Stalingrad pocket from the west. Second, it demonstrated that the Stavka, and perhaps Vatutin as well, had lost some confidence in Romanenko. Popov's attacks are to begin the 13th. While his shock army is forming though, 5th tank army is still attacking on the chair. On the 9th and 10th, the attacks in general fail or are inconclusive. And near the end of the day, the 10th, Stavka Intelligence reports German reinforcements en route. So today, most of 5th tank army is playing defense with limited attacks ordered near Sorovikino and Ostrovsky just to tie down and, and wear down the 11th Panzer and 336 Infantry Divisions. They do manage to expand the bridgehead west of Sorovikino and make two separate small breakthroughs on the river. But above all, they continue diverting the attention of the 48th Panzer Corps. There is also plenty of fighting in the Stalingrad pocket itself. As last week ended, Rodion Malinovsky's Second Guards Army got the job of destroying it. And he plans to begin operations now on the 10th. But moving the troops into the area is trickier than expected, so his attacks won't go off until next week. But front commanders Rokosovsky and Yeremenko are not waiting around. They've been ordered to launch at least, well, some sort of offensive operations. Up to the 5th, Rokosovsky's Don Front hits the enemy with the 21st, 65th and part of the 24th Army against the west of the pocket, while 66th Army and the rest of 24th fight to tie down enemy reserves. Yeromenko's Stalingrad Front has been launching mainly local attacks. By the 5th, Rokosovsky realizes that without the 2nd Guard's army or somebody's help, further attacks are useless. Chief of Staff Alexander Vasilevsky actually agrees in general, but there are pretty strong attacks anyhow by all the Don and Stalingrad front armies, the 8th to 10th, to soften up the enemy where they plan to have Malinovsky attack. So these are basically sacrificial attacks for the long-term greater good. But guess what? If you look at the Red Army and German 6th Army staff reports, the Soviets this week have a chance to to unhinge Friedrich Paulus's 6th Army defenses. Most of those attacks, the 8th, fail pretty quickly, okay? But not so the Don Front Army's attacks against 6th Army's Western Front. Well, mainly 21st Army's attack, which cuts a two kilometer wide and six kilometer deep hole in the German defenses by nightfall, capturing several high points. This sort of penetration if exploited, could completely undo Paulus's defenses. David Glantz points out, though, that it is not mentioned in most histories of the battle, but it is in both the Soviet and German reports. It takes until the end of the week for 14th Panzer Corps to clear elements of the 21st Army from its rear, and that's pretty heavy fighting. Paulus's 6th Army literally dodged a bullet when it effectively blunted the offensive by Rokosovsky's armies on the 8th of December. But given the resources the Don Front commander threw into the battle, it was a close call. Defeating the offensive also depleted 6th Army's meager supplies of fuel and ammunition. Paulus sends a message on the 10th to Army Group Don that the heavy fighting and the lack of rations is really beginning to affect morale and his army's defensive capability. He's basically asking Manstein to come on in and rescue his army. Well, we know that Manstein is planning an operation to do just that, to be launched next week. Remember, there are some 300,000 men surrounded in that big pocket who all need food and supplies to be able to continue to fight. Stavka realizes that they sort of do have time on their side. As long as they can hold off any relief attacks, they can keep 6th Army in its pocket as it runs out of food and ammunition. 
This is not the case further north. In fact, the Germans have organized a counterattack versus the Kalinin Front from the west of the Rezhev salient, surrounding a whole bunch of Soviet troops. On the 8th, Stavka sends orders to both the western and Kalinin fronts, basically repeating its earlier orders to destroy the enemy at Rezhev, Sichovka, Olenino, and Belyi by January 1st, 1943. It adds to this, though, by saying they also have to destroy the enemy at Gzhatsk, Kholm, and Vyazima by the end of January. Georgi Zhukov, who masterminded that whole operation, is not satisfied, and he's begun sacking officers and reinforcing his armies. Today on the 11th, 20th, 31st, and 29th armies resume the attacks along their entire front. And near Veliki Luki on the 5th, a major Soviet attack cuts the link between the Gebirgsjäger and the surrounded Gruppe Meyer that was established last week. Survivors from Gruppe Meyer reach the mountain troops after dark, leaving all of their heavy equipment. They then pull back towards Chernosum Station. The Germans then start shifting troops around for another relief attack towards Veliki Luki itself. To the northwest, the 8th Panzers are also attacking towards it, but they're stopped by the 9th. Attacks from the south are also unsuccessful. When you think about it, Veliki Luki has been surrounded for two solid weeks, but has yet to see real combat. That changes the 10th, when elements of the Soviet 357th rifles, backed by Katyusha rockets, attack. That day and today, attacks reach the suburbs, but the German defenses hold. And that brings me to the end of the week. A week that certainly must be frustrating for Axis commanders, as they can't feed their troops in the South Pacific, are sorely beleaguered all over the front in the Soviet Union, but have at least held back the enemy in Tunisia. There is also Operation Frankton this week, a British commando raid on the port of Bordeaux that damages eight ships. And you can learn more about that on our Instagram day-by-day -day coverage of the war which is also available at our website, timeghost.tv. It is exactly a year ago this week that Japan expanded its war from one against China to one against the Allies, bringing the US into the war with the attacks on Pearl Harbor and the Philippines. And then soon enough, taking Malaya, the Dutch East Indies, the Philippines, Burma, and so on, and building their new empire. Yamamoto's plan said straight out they would have six months to run wild, which they did almost to the day until midway, after which they should have consolidated to the point that it would be too difficult or too costly for the Americans, the only military Yamamoto was worried about fighting, to want to fight them for it, and the new empire would be a fait accompli. That has not really gone to plan, since the Americans are very much fighting them for it, as are the other allied nations united in the struggle. Yamamoto cannot be happy with that. You know what else Yamamoto cannot be happy about? Just one year after all of the offensives were launched, tens of thousands of Japanese troops starving to death in the jungles of the Solomon Islands, because that is what's happening. I'm pretty sure that was not part of Yamamoto's plans. Hey, in spite of all the death and horror going on, the holiday season is soon upon us. And a couple of years ago, on our Time Goes History channel, we did a series of eight historical specials that have to do with the various holidays. And you can check out that playlist right here. And I have no idea who our patron or Time Ghost Army member of the week is. Yes. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Christian Rowland. That was pretty cool, wasn't it? Yeah. Thanks to people like Christian, well, the rest of the army, um, we are able to make, well, all of these episodes. You've noticed that these, if you, well, you can't count the words, but the World War II episodes are now around 3,000 words a week. They were about 1,800, 1,900 words when the war started. So the war is getting longer. We are using more resources, much like the Germans, much like the Soviets, and, well, much like everybody, I suppose. Uh, and you can support us in this effort at timeghost.tv or patreon.com, or if you're already supporting us, Feel free to increase your pledge so that we can make ever more of this fantastic history in 1943. See you next time.